Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Artists Talk on Art for our panel this Monday, March 14th. My name is Kristen, and I'm the Programming Coordinator at ATOA, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. For tonight's panel, we're featuring the critic and author, Alan D. Coleman, as our moderator, with Lori Antonacci and Douglas Shear, who are two of the co-founders of Artists Talk on Art, established in 1974, We'll be discussing the history of A2A this evening. Uh, please keep in mind their comments are their own and may not represent those of the entire organization. So we expect uh, our Zoom panel to last about 90 minutes, which we'll be recording and later posting on our YouTube channel. So to start off the evening, we'll have uh, the 15 minute presentation that Doug mentioned, which includes never publicly before seen historic A2A photographs that will be sharing with all of you tonight. And your questions and comments are invited, which you can add in the Zoom chat, um, which you can find at the bottom of your screen there on Zoom. And we'll get to those later after the panel. So before introductions, I also wanna make note of next week's presentation, which will be taking place on Monday the 21st. This is part of our legacy series and will feature ATOA's previous executive director, the performance artist Vernita Nemec, interviewing former MoMA curator Rob Storr. And this dialogue originally took place on February 6, 1998, and will be an excellent follow-up to tonight's discussion, so don't miss that. And for Alan now, uh, we have Alan Coleman as our moderator. He has published eight books and more than 2,500 essays on photography and related subjects, formerly a columnist for The Village Voice, The New York Times, and The New York Observer, Coleman has contributed to Art News, Art on Paper, Technology Review, Juliet Art Magazine in Italy, European Photography in Germany, La Fotografia in Spain, and Art Today in China. His work has been translated into 21 languages and published in 31 countries. In 2002, he received the Culture Prize from the German Photographic Society and was the first photography critic ever so honored. In 2010, he received the J. Dudley Johnston Award from the Royal Phot Photographic Society based in the UK for sustained excellence in writing about photography. In 2014, he received the Society for Photographic Education's Insight Award for lifetime contribution to the field and in 2015, he was honored by the Society of Professional Journalists with the XD, sorry, SDX Award for research about journalism. Coleman's widely read blog, Photocritic International, can be accessed at photocritic.com. And I'll include that link in the chat later on. So since 2005, Coleman's curated exhibitions have been shown internationally at museums, galleries, and festivals in Canada, China, Finland, Hong Kong, Italy, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, Taiwan, and throughout the US. In addition to moderating and participating in ATO panels over the past decades, Coleman has also served as an informal consultant to the organization on various issues and published our first website in the mid 90s. He has also been an advisor to the ATOA archival committee to address project issues in this last few years and has been involved in courting prospective institutions and the placement of our archive, which now resides in the archives of American art at the Smithsonian Institution. So here is Alan. Okay, well, hello there. Um, hello. I'm honored to, uh, to be part of this uh, project and have a long history with uh, ATOA and also with a number of the members, including uh, especially my oldest friend, uh, Doug Shear. So let me introduce the, the two panelists tonight. Uh, Lori Antonacci is co-founder of Artist Talk on Art and served as its founding president, treasurer, and executive director. She served on the board of directors from 1974 to 1990 and from 2001 to 2011, was co-chair of the ATOA Archives Committee and currently serves on the advisory board. Lori has a BA in visual art and art history from Bradley University. 
She served on the Artist Certification Committee Appeals Board of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and as officer and board member of the Foundation for the Community of Artists, Artists Community Federal Credit Union, Artists Housing Coalition, New York Women's Agenda, and Women Creating Change from the, uh, the uh, part of the Women's City Club. She was also adjunct academic advisor and instructor at New York University. Lori began her career in New York City as a video producer and documentary filmmaker. She is now an independent marketing and communications consultant and fundraiser whose clients have included American Express, Forbes, Scientific American, the United Nations, World Health Organization, Height and Hills, the 1M1B Foundation, and Spark Fund. Doug Shear, this, the second panelist, is an artist and writer now living in Woodstock, New York. His artist parents took part in the WPA Artist Union and the Hans Hoffman classes in uh, mid-century New York area. He grew up in Greenwich Village and spent summers in Provincetown. In addition to being a painter, he was a pioneer of video art and ran the egg store in Tribeca where Antonacci and Bob Wiegand were customers along with Namjoon Pike, Yoko Ono, Mary Lucier, Twyla Tharp, Carolee Schneeman, Charlotte Moorman, Bill Viola, Francis Lee, Aldo Tambellini, and Merce Cunningham. From the mid-1970s through the 1980s, he served as mayoral appointee to the Artist Certification Committee of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, representing the Soho Artists Association. During this period, he also served on the board of the Foundation for the Community of Artists. In 1974, he co-founded Artists Talk on Art with Antonacci and Wiegand. Uh, this is the art world's longest running aesthetic panel series, which has presented over 8,500 artists in more than 1,000 panels and dialogues. He's the organization's president and became chairman em emeritus in 2019. He is currently serving as programming chair for 2022, and he was archivist of the ATOA archive, which now resides, as mentioned, at the Archives of American Art, a division of the Smithsonian Institution. Past and parallel non-professional art, non-art professional jobs uh, and, and work that Cheer has uh, been involved with have included magazine editor and publisher, advertising director and ad agency executive, tech writer, foreign correspondent, formerly read monthly in 80 plus countries in 13 languages, technology market researcher with 1800 clients over 38 years, including Adobe, Apple, Avid, Canon, Eastman Kodak, Leica, NAB, Panasonic, Polaroid, Sony, and Toshiba, and served as governor of the Society of Motion Pictures and Television en Engineers for the New York region. He has also served as a board member of the Vision Fund of the Lighthouse for the Blind. He serves on the Education and Public Engagement Committee of the nearby Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art at SUNY New Paltz. He is a board member of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild, where he serves on the exhibition and programming committees and leads the Birdcliff Forum virtual talk series. He, finally, he is the one officer of ATOA who has served continuously since its founding 48 years ago. So, with those impressive credentials in mind, we're now gonna start a PowerPoint presentation on the history of ATOA. And uh, both Lori and I will uh, sort of narrate it. Next slide. Uh -huh. Okay, so these are some photographs related to the egg store. On the left is a Nam June Paik sculpture made up of video monitors. There's me uh, uh, still wet behind the ears at, at the studio camera uh, in the egg store. And on the right is Charlotte Moorman doing one of her video cello uh, performances. And I met Doug um, in November 1973, when I hired him, I was on convention out in Washington, D.C., and I hired his team to come in and do a filming of 
who was then Vice President Gerald Ford and then President Nixon giving speeches at the National Association of Realtors of all things. And um, then I moved to New York City actually in May, 1974. Right. Um, so as I had said earlier, or as was read earlier, uh, I met Lori and Bob while I was running the egg store. Um, and uh, that's a picture of Bob and one of his children on the right. And that uh, other photo is of some of the early steering committee, early board members. On the left, Bruce Barton, then Lori, then myself, then Irving Sandler and Corinne Robbins. And I believe that's on the occasion of one of the early anniversaries. I think perhaps perhaps the either the 10th or might've been the 10th, might've been the 20th, don't know. Uh, the original idea for Artist Talk on Art was hatched in a, uh, a Connecticut uh, picnic uh, on, in the summer of 1974. And in the fall, we put together the steering committee which, which had on it uh, Lori, Bob, myself, Bruce, Connie, Cynthia Navarretta, Irving Sandler. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's the original steering committee. And my inspiration actually for becoming involved was that when I moved here, one of the things that happened pretty quickly is I ended up picking up a book called The Artist's World by Fred McDara uh, in the old Double Days bookstore. And, um, realized the whole art community of the 60s, 50s and 60s. And as an art history major, although we were taught the big name artists, no one mentioned the New York City art community, the club or anything about that. And I became very intrigued, interested and inspired about what we could create that might be similar. Yeah, I think I think all, all three of us had a copy of the same book, and um, um, I still have it on the shelves behind me. So the club was definitely a major influence uh, for why we decided mutually to uh, to start a talk series, a forum. Can you define the club briefly? The club was uh, a uh, a talk series, but it really was more of a place where the abstract expressionists would go, it was in the village uh, on or around A Street, uh, around University Place in that general area, it moved a few times. And um, it was originally founded by Philip Pabia and A.E. Navaretta, who was uh, Cynthia Navaretta's former husband. Um, well, was her husband at that time. And it was a place that was, was mainly white and male, uh, very few female mem members, maybe eight or 10 at the most. Um, and you know, from what I know of it, it was kind of a drunken brawl. Uh, it all, they were also quite antagonistic about the, the idea of recording anything or preserving anything. And for that reason, to this day, there's only one recording that survives which uh, is called the debate between Milton Resnick and Ed Reinhardt <clears throat> that survived from all the years in which they made, uh, you know, a few audio recordings or the occasional film. There was no video at the time. Uh, so there actually was a, a history of artists talking informally at places like Waldorf Cafe, uh, Cafeteria, the Chuck true. Wagon and everything. There was also subjects of the artist school which was put together by Robert Motherwell and Barnett Newman, which was about 1948, 49. Right. And there was Studio 35, which again was an informal conversation series in the spring of 1949. And then the club was 1948 to 1962 in one form or another. And according to Cynthia Navaretta, they actually didn't have any female members. You couldn't be a member, but you could be a guest. Right, but there were there were a, a small group of those guests. Uh, yeah, she was very active. Nevelson, Marisol, you know, a very small hand. Pat Paslov, but a very small group that had uh, admission uh, permission, I guess you'd say. Okay, well, let's get back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. 
Well, after uh, Doug and Bob and I uh, had chatted, et cetera, uh, everybody reached out, particularly Bob um, and Bruce Barton, who had been uh, at a Bruce Barton, who was a painter who had been a member of the club. Irving Sandler had actually done kind of organizing for the club from about 1958 to 62 and was an art historian. Then Corinne Robbins was a younger group of art historians. Um, and then Cynthia Navaretta, who came to programming committee meetings, actually didn't join the steering committee as I look back on my things until about um, 1981. Let's go to another slide. Please. <clears throat> Here we go. So uh, in the earliest years, uh, when we should say people paid a dollar at the door and they sat on the floor or they brought their own cushions or sometimes they would bring beach chairs. Um, the earliest panels were in January of 1975 at a small gallery called The Open Mind, which was in Soho. And our first audience was 92, but we pretty rapidly grew into hundreds of people on a Friday night. They were always on Friday nights in, in the first few decades. And um, the reason that the audiences were fairly large was that people were generally walking from their lofts. You know, they lived within walking distance of where we would hold the panels. Uh, the picture in the center, that's, that's uh, uh, Milton Resnick on the left of the center picture. Um, on the right is Lori on the far right. And that's my daughter, Regina, sitting with her. Uh, on the lower left is a picture of uh, some of the early, I, I believe that's programming committee, although many of them are board members. Yeah, and one of the things when we put together the, uh, uh, the organization was that we wanted to be egalitarian and inclusive. Anyone, any artist could recommend a program and then it went through the steering committee, which were all artists uh, or the programming committee rather. Um, it was open to anyone to attend. It was a dollar for everyone. The only way you got out of not paying your dollar was if you were unemployed, in which case you volunteered and helped out. Next slide. So this is from the 1980s. Uh, on top is Alice Neal. Uh, in the center, Leon Golub. On the right is, um, uh, that's Cuspid on the far right, and Irving Sandler in the center, and Benny Andrews on the left in the right-hand picture. On the left-hand picture is Cynthia Navaretta. Center sitting is James Brooks, the painter, and that's the sculptor, Philip Previa, uh, standing. Um, on the lower right is uh, the Ocarina Orchestra, a conception of uh, uh, Lenny Horowitz, who is standing, standing in the dark uh, jacket on the right. Next the other one. thing. Oh, go ahead. Well, the other thing to note about when we organized it is that um, Bob Wiegand went to Robert Perlmutter, Pearl Paints, and got a $200 donation. And then we went to the, uh, to the Soho Artists Association, to Charles Leslie, Sylvie Pruitt, and Larry Tierney, and they right. gave us their mailing list, which was 300 right. artists. Right. And that was kind of the organizational framework. Right. Postcard, po petty postcard mailings. Next slide. So this is now the 1990s, and in the upper left-hand corner is Ivan Karp, who had been uh, the assistant to uh, Leo Castelli. Uh, oh, uh, now that's one where I wanted to see that slide a little more. Uh, 
Okay. Can you go back one slide? Yeah, okay, thank you. Lower left-hand corner is a sculptor, Sal Romano. I don't know all the panelists in the center picture, but the person in the very center of it is Colette, the, uh, the artist. And on the right hand is myself, uh, a very uncomfortable looking Larry Rivers, and uh, the, our then executive director, Vernita Nemet. Larry looked like uh, he was, you know, preparing for a mugshot there. Next slide. So there's another birthday party. There's Lori and I at what might have been, I think, perhaps the 25th birthday of ATOA or 30th. Uh, that's the artist, Andrew Serrano. That's uh, Norma Greenwood, who is a board member. Uh, that's Fong Boy of the Brooklyn Rail. And then there's myself, Jean-Claude and Christo on their, on their final appearance in uh, 2005. Next slide. From the 2010s, uh, more, more up toward the present, on the far left is um, Sophie Matisse, the granddaughter of, of the artist Matisse. Uh, that's Larry Poons. Uh, I've, I have to say I've forgotten this woman's name, but she's, she happens to be Ukrainian. And then that's uh, Mike. Uh, this is how I lose friends. Uh, I can't remember his name. And this is this is um, uh, Grace Gracie uh, hmm? Gracie Mansion, who is uh, uh, currently associated with uh, Artnet. And then Mitch Pilnick, who is a board member and creator of many panels. Next slide. Programming committee meetings. The one on the left is from roughly around 1980. Uh, you know, the, it just gives you an idea that we would have a lot of people at those meetings. Uh, and then the one on the right is a little bit later. It's more like in the 2000s. Um, I looked at some of our early early flyers. And I just want to read some of the program committee. I mean, on the first program committee, besides the steering committee or board, right. Edit Diak, Ted Stams, Don Hazlett, Cynthia Navaretta, mm -hmm. 1977, Pat Pazloff, Sal Romano, Johan Selenrod, mm -hmm. A.T. Coleman, right. 1978, Lynn Mayo, Solomon F., Bud Hopkins, Leon Golub, Janet Haidt, 1979, Doris Chase, Joyce Kozloff, Tom Budis, Douglas Braswell and Pat Maynardi. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were probably other people uh, during that same period because people came and went. But there's right. always been a very robust program committee full of artists. Right, true. Uh, in that same photograph on the right, on the lower right hand corner is Donna Markser, who was also a fairly long running uh, executive director. Next slide. These are some of the programming directors. So Renita Nemec was not only executive director, but handled programming for almost a decade. There's Donna Markser, Markser Molly Barnes, who is a, a gallerist in, in Los Angeles and also comes back and forth to New York. Um, then uh, Anne, uh, Anne Lidecker, uh, who was associated with uh, Christie's, um, our own Peter Duhan, who's on the board and, and has been a programming director for us. And then Lynn Mayacole, who has, was executive director and president for quite a long time until fairly recently, and um, has been involved in the past with ATOA going back to the late 1970s. Next slide. Bars, you know, where did we go after the panels? Well, we went to many different locations, but in the uh, in the earliest days, the 70s and 80s, Ken's Broom Street Bar, Max's Kansas City, Finelli, 
I think we had three or four different iterations of going to Finelli's. Next slide. So over the last 48 years, ATOA had uh, all sorts of um, different locations. And I'm not gonna read these all, but it, if you read them, you just get an idea that we were, we were easily in 20, maybe even as many as 25 different locations over our almost 50 years. And um, we would usually be in a place until they got sick of us. You know, they, I mean, they liked us. We brought in a lot of people, which was a good thing. Many of the places were galleries, uh, but ultimately uh, it, it, it got to a point where it was enough and we moved on. But it, the relationships are always very nice. What was great is that certainly for the first 25 or 30 years, and Doug can speak to the others, all of the spaces were donated. We did not, we did not pay a space fee, which is part of what made the, the uh, made us be able to continue. Right, right. And you know, for the majority of our time, we, we had uh, pro bono space. Next slide. So, you know, we really covered the waterfront on, on genres, on categories. Um, you know, we also had many, what I would call business of art, uh, panels over the years. And so we involved not only artists, but also art writers, historians, collectors, curators, some gallery directors, not very many, uh, and a few art world attorneys. We did things on uh, trust and estates and foundations, copyright law, artist housing. Uh, but our main, our main thrust was and always, you know, continues to be uh, on aesthetic issues. That's mainly yeah. what I wanted to talk about. Go ahead. And in the beginning, there was a lot of debate about whether there should be any dealers ever on a panel. Right. Uh, so for a number of years, I think uh, two or three years, uh, it was only artists. In the beginning, it was primarily visual artists, and then it expanded. Mm -hmm. uh, critics were a different thing. Uh, critics were on panels much earlier. Uh, and then I think... Um, you know, it became open to everyone. Over time, true. Yeah. Next slide. Ah, okay. So these are, this is just a very small sample of, of the people, both artists and, and also critics and art writers and historians and so on, mainly artists here who have appeared at, at ATOA over the years. Um, uh, and in any category, there, there have been uh, ama an amazing variety. That's all I would say. And uh, one of the great things from the very beginning and all the way through is everyone who appeared agreed to do it free because it was artists speaking to a community of artists. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. That's true. And uh, I could say also, looking at the names, that um, one of the main ways that we have, have supported ourselves over the years has been through auctions. And we have really enjoyed uh, the support of the art community, particularly of artists, uh, for which we are forever grateful. Next slide. These you could, uh, who, you know, we can just flip through these pretty quickly, but these are examples of the flyers when we were still doing printed mailings. This is from the earliest season. Uh, whatever happened to public art was the opening panel. Uh, but you can click through these a little bit more quickly and just spend, you know, 10 seconds or so on each of these slides now. It's interesting, the first set of, uh, of panels was whatever happened to public art, mm -hmm. then fantasy in the figure, Rhino Horn, mm -hmm. eroticism in heart, video, the video documentary, see or no, mm -hmm. the pattern in painting, color in painting in the mid seventies, 
and the print workshop, A New American Phenomenon. That was our first series, which was already very diverse. Right. Next slide, please. There's some examples on the left of the postcard mailings, uh, but many of the mailings were of this sort of full page. And when you would go to people's lofts in that, in that era, it, you would see artists talk on art right up on the refrigerator with a refrigerator magnet uh, or on the loft elevator door um, or the loft door. Uh, and many people would start their weekend by going to an ATOA panel on Friday night and then uh, you know, plan for whatever else they were gonna do from there. Next slide. And, yeah, that's a 1970, uh, a series of our 1979 on the right, mm -hmm. which by the way was Why Make Art in New York, which I actually moderated. Mm -hmm. Art in Transition, five dealers have their say, there are the dealers. Mm -hmm. Racism in Art, continuing the dialogue and street painters, right. realism on the spot. Right, next slide please. I, I would just keep clicking through these because we need to pick up the pace and go on to the interview. Yeah, great, great. Next slide. These are some audience, audience shots. Uh, the one on the right is a particularly large event. Uh, I think there were close to 400 people in the audience. And uh, that it was, we knew it would be large so we actually had it at a high school around Spring and uh, and Sixth Avenue. I think that was the um, 1983 fundraising panel, Art and Art Criticism, which would have been Hilton Kramer, Donald Cuspid, Barbara Rose, Ingrid Sishi, with Irving mm -hmm. Sandler as the moderator. I think that's correct. It might, I think Benny Andrews also ended up sitting into that one, I think. Might have. Might have. Uh, anyway, those are typical audience scenes. Next slide. The other way. So this is people who have been presidents. Lori was the first. The group uh, that's the, the group scene is at an auction about maybe 15 years ago. Uh, that's Amy Ernst, who is the granddaughter of Max. Uh, that's Diane Arndt, Renita Nemec, Lori, uh, Donna Markser, and Sarah Kay, all who had served as executive director. <clears throat> and on, on the upper slide, that's um, the far right is George Rada. Uh, that's um, in the lower right hand corner is uh, Barry Kostrinsky, who was president until uh, December of last year. That's Lynn Mayacole and senior moment. Yeah, definitely senior moment. Albert Dupa, all, all past presidents. Next slide. So raising money for ATOA quickly, uh, once we obtained our own 501c3, we were able to which, which was not at the very beginning, we were able to uh, apply for our own grants directly. Before that, we were actually doing it through Cynthia Navaretta's mid-March associates. And uh, otherwise we've always had financial donations. We've, we've had many grants. Uh, as I said, we've been favored by donations from many artists and had a number of auctions. Over the it's interesting because I think our first grant we applied for to New York State Council on the Arts was 1978. And mm -hmm. we got rejected because, and this was the only reason, you do not have a paid executive director. Oh, okay. So for the future grants, we had Lori Antonacci, executive director, paid $1 a year. And we started to get grants. Right. Um, okay, next slide. How the archive was organized, briefly stated, uh, it. I found that the first time that I ever tried to pitch the archive was after we had, uh, was about 26 years before we finally placed the archive in 2016. 
And that was by writing a letter to the then librarian of MoMA, uh, Clive Philpott, who, uh, who was on a panel on, on artist books, which is how I met him. Um, but otherwise, it, it took years of storing under proper conditions, years of locating missing materials and missing recordings, uh, sorting by all sorts of criteria, uh, correlating a bunch of, you know, I think we were like 60 boxes of papers that also went down to archives. Uh, first by digitizing the audio materials, which was 1975 through 1990, uh, which happened around 2006 and seven, and then scanning a number of stills, there were thousands of stills, Next slide, please. Uh, choosing the right institution. Uh, I, Lori and I came to an understanding that we won't talk about who the runners up were, but just to say that um, between those that I had been uh, pitching over a number of years, uh, and then Lori came on to help me, uh, there were more than 40 in institutions that were prospects. Uh, there, I mean, just as an example, there were, in addition to the Clive Philpott outreach, there were two other rounds with MoMA. But, you know, in general, uh, many museums, many huge library, libraries, uh, some foreign institutions, uh, but, but we remain very, very happy that we selected Archives of American Art of Smithsonian, how they've handled things and uh, the continuing relationship. Uh, One of the interesting things that made this the archive possible is that we began audio recording from day one. Right. And that makes because all of us had some uh, background in film or video, as well mm -hmm. as art. And we had also release forms signed from day one. Right. Uh, and, and although there are some missing recordings, we actually began day one. There's a there's a photo of Bob Wiegand sitting on the floor with his back against a pillar with a reel-to-reel -reel audio recording little mm -hmm. machine next to him in right. one of the first years. Right. Next, next slide, please. So what the future holds. Uh, Zoom has transformed what we do. So for the last two years, we've been doing almost everything, virtually everything by Zoom on a weekly basis. And going forward, we intend to continue, uh, continue doing virtual, uh, maybe exclusively, we don't know yet, but certainly uh, in our build out of audience, uh, we're increasingly linking up to other platforms beyond Zoom. With the, with the Zoom itself. And then of course we have a YouTube channel. Next slide. And that's it. And uh, let's go to Alan and some questions. Uh, there is a question in the chat now from Patricia. Would you say that your talks were mainly attended and marketed to artists? Uh, the, answer, the short answer would be yes. Uh, the whole idea of Artists Talk on Art was for artists talking to the art community and anyone else who was really interested. And part of that was that any artist could suggest a topic to have a conversation on. And if they could get artists together, then the odds of the program committee approving, I think it was like 80% approval. We once had a psychiatrist who said, we wanted, I want to do a panel. And my answer to him was, can you find three artists who would like to talk about what you'd like to talk about? He couldn't. So that did not happen. Mm -hmm. But basically, we encouraged that we encouraged the fact of artists coming up with ideas to talk about whatever they were interested in talking about. And as for the audience, I think it was primarily artists, but it was anyone who was interested in the topic of that program. And owned a pillow. Uh, so in the early days, yes. In the early days. Then we actually bought cushions. So Alan, before you start the interview, uh, I just want to read something about Bob Wiegand, since otherwise he's not here to represent himself. This is the obit written by Roberta Smith in June of 1994. 
Robert Wiegand, painter, 60, led Soho Loft Drive. It's short. Robert Wiegand, a painter and video artist who helped lead a campaign to legalize artist residences in lofts in Lower Manhattan, died last Thursday. He was 60 and lived in Manhattan. Mr. Wiegand collapsed on a subway plat. Well, I'll skip that. I mean, he died in the subway. He was born in 1934 in Mineola, New York and earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the State University, University at Buffalo. He had his first exhibition of abstract expressionist paintings at the Phoenix Gallery in Soho in 1960. They were on 10th Street at the time. By the early 1970s, he had turned to video, exhibiting his tapes at the Kitchen and Film Anthology Archive and frequently collaborating with his first wife, Ingrid Wiegand. He led artist groups throughout his career and was active in artist organizations. In the late 1960s, he was a founder of 10 Downtown, an annual exhibition of open studios and of City Walls, which commissioned large murals for exteriors of buildings throughout New York City. His own mural, an enormous red, yellow, and green abstraction is still visible on a building at Astor Place in Lafayette Street. That's now gone. In 1968, when the city threatened to evict artists living in lofts in Lower Manhattan, he helped to found the Soho Artists Association. His work is in collections of museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Everson Museum in Syracuse, and the Museum of Modern Art in New Delhi, India. Uh, that's basically what I wanted to read you. Anyway, Alan, we're yours. There's okay. one other thing that you might want to Huh. I'm What's hoping that? I'll come up on the video, but I guess not. Okay. I was going to show one of Bob's paintings, but that's okay. Okay. Um, well, you okay. can see it over your we've, shoulder. We've anyway. already covered uh, some of the questions uh, that I had in mind. Um, so let me uh, let me pick up where uh, where I think we might uh, fill in. How, how was ATOA funded and how has that changed over time? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Lori has already mentioned that uh, grants from particularly the, uh, the early 1980s through, I'll say through the 90s, grants were pretty frequent and regular. Um, but by the mid 1980s, it started to dry up for us and we had to turn more toward auctions. And so a lot of what we've done since then were auctions. Although um, I, I don't know exactly how far back the auctions went. Sometime in the 1990s was probably the first auction. Uh, our largest auction, which was one we held when we were attempting to raise funds for the digitization of the audio video, uh, particularly the audio at that time, was in 2006. Um, and since then, and since then, there have been, I believe, another three auctions, uh, possibly four. What's uh, interesting in terms of starting out is that not, between 1974 to 77, 78, we did not receive grants other than that first $200 from uh, Perlmutter. Uh, we actually existed on the gate, which was basically a dollar a head. And we did that because we had attendees and because no one associated with Artist Talk on Art took a penny. It was all volunteer. And the, the, venues, the venues were free. And the venues were pro bono. Right. So uh, that really was a testament for the fact. I mean, when we started, we didn't know if people wanted to talk. Mm -hmm. And it's a testament for the fact that they did. And then when we were funded, the years they gave us money for artist stipends, which were only a couple of years. Um, one year we sent every artist a dollar because that's what it came out and everyone was equal. Another year we sent every artist $5 because again, everyone was equal. Now many artists sent the money back for funding, which was great. Okay, well, you, it, in effect, you're, a lot of what you've already said goes to the next question, 
but uh, let me ask it anyway. What was the nature of the art world in the 1970s and how would you, looking back, define ATOA's role in that context? Right, so uh, there was a lot of uproar. Uh, part of it was the Vietnam War uh, and a lot of political art that was targeting, you know, it was anti-Vietnam War art. Uh, at the same time, a huge movement in feminism and feminist art uh, and the, the first real efforts being made to be truly inclusive uh, to um, not just to people of color, but also to be very inclusive, to try to, you know, aesthetically inclusive. Uh, because the club, for example, had been largely, not entirely, but largely about abstract expressionism. <clears throat> and in fact, when our first decade at least our first decade, many abstract expressionists appeared at, at Artist Talk on Art. Um, and interestingly, because I spoke earlier about the, the paucity of recordings during that previous era, interestingly, we, we recorded many of those abstract expressionists in what may be the only recordings that exist of them. Um, but it was a it was a very tumultuous uh, time. And it was also an era of more independent galleries, artist-run galleries. Right. Um, and uh, a you of know, a group of, group of young critics and um, curators. Um, so, and it was a very diverse uh, art scene in terms of the, the types of art being made, what you wanted to talk about, there were hardest housing issues, um, there were health issues that had come up during the 80s, the HIV uh, issue, and we actually did a panel on that. Um, and so I think Artists Talk on Arts topics mirrored what was happening through the ages. Well, I, I think, you know, specifically aesthetically. Yes, definitely. Those times. So where abstract expressionism had already been somewhat in decline and was and was superseded by pop. Uh, by the time we started Artist Talk on Art, minim minimalism was enormous, conceptual art was enormous, uh, uh, hyper realistic art was was very big. Photo realism. Photo realism. Earthworks. Yeah. Uh, body art. Sort of Carolee Schneeman. Performance art. Yeah. Performance art. Right. So, so it was a very um, a very busy period with a lot of different movements competing with each other. Uh, and, you know, I can say that it was a good time for us to have a forum in which they could express themselves. Hmm. Could you describe a typical panel or a typical dialogue? What, uh, what, what was the format? <laughs> right. so, well, the format, the format was when we actually set it up this way. No big introductions. You would have not you would have not heard bios read. Each artist had five minutes to show slides. They could show five slides. They could show fifty. They could show recent work. They sh could show history. But it was here. You are. Here's my work. That was the introduction. Then there was a moderator. There was a moderator organizer. Most panels kind of followed that format, but not necessarily. Um, and if the panels got boring or off topic, you had the audience who popped in. Uh, there was a 1984 panel on international mail art where um, the, uh, one of the artists on the panel decided, uh, well, there was a group of them, decided to depose the moderator because she had dared to curate a male art show, which was no, no. And this occurred and the moderator and her small contingent stomped out saying, that's the end of the panel. 99% of the audience stayed and we continued the panel. And uh, that's so it was M-A-I-L. Yes, M-A-I-L. Right. Art. Uh, but, so but, it, was, but was, uh, it was an eclectic yeah. right. group, but there was really a, was that was a particular format and it always opened yeah. to audience questions. There really was a format though, the format. And first of all, until around our 20th year, almost that long, we had 
barely done any dialogues. Everything was a panel. Right. Because we felt that even dialogues were a little too focused on, on one person. Uh, so we didn't do those. We also, uh, prior to Ivan Karp appearing for the first time, which was around 89 or 90, uh, no gallerist had ever appeared. So, you know, that was considered too commercial. So we wouldn't allow a gallerist. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the format was, even from the earliest days, an introduction, then, you know, a period in which each artist could show their work, uh, the moderator then bringing, walking them through a series of questions, and then turning it over to the audience for Q&A. And that has been, whether it would run 90 minutes or whether it would run two hours, as it often did, that was pretty much the format historically that we still follow. What was the first dialogue? And could you define what you mean by that? Mm. Uh, well, a, di a dialogue, what we have tonight is a trialogue, don't we? So it's, it's two people speaking with one person interviewing them. Uh, otherwise, a dialogue, and I've, I've interviewed you on a number of occasions. So it's when it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, that's a dialogue. Okay. Um, the way A2A would do it, would it, it would generally be a pairing, if possible, of a critic and an artist, but not always. Sometimes it was two artists in a conversation. So, you know, that it was not too heavy handed in that sense, uh, or it could be a historian. Do you remember who the first one was? I don't. Okay. Sorry. Do you remember about when? Um, I think that the first, hmm. The very first dialogue could have been, this is a candidate, could have been Alice Neal, because that would have been in the 1980s, uh, the early-ish 1980s. She was- mm -hmm. No, there were no dialogues actually in the 80s. I, I disagree with you, Lori, sorry. Okay. In general, we agree with each other, but this is one I don't. And I know because I picked her up from her home on both of these occasions. You know, I drove my car up there, picked her up, took her down to Soho, and then took her home at the end. And the first time I know vividly was a panel with her, which was probably the late 70s. But the next time she appeared, uh, we made an exception ah. because it was Alice Neal. So that's likely, I don't know for sure, but it's likely one of the very first dialogues. Yeah, another early one I'm yeah. looking at, because I'm looking at early flyers, right. uh, was December 1981, Lil mm -hmm. Picard interviewed by Sylviana Goldsmith. Uh huh. Yeah, that's so there were a few. There were a few. Uh, I know, for example, that I, may I, have been the earliest. I don't I know. I believe that Bob Wiegand in the 80s interviewed Philip Pavia. So there's another one that I'm remembering. <clears throat> but when we got to our 20th anniversary year, which was, you know, the fall of one year and the, the winter, spring of the next, that whole stretch of a year, see what we would call our season, we did 20 one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, which we called 20 on 20. And that really set the tone for going forward where we did much more routinely uh, dialogues. Mm -hmm. When, when I, I know you started recording from day one, right. when did you move from audio recording to video recording? And that right now, that does not seem like a momentous decision, but I think back then it was a momentous decision. So can you talk right. about that? Um, 1990 is when we made the transition, uh, sometime in 1990. And that was with the help of, of the late Flashlight, who uh, Robert Daneman is his uh, original name, who was our original webmaster and was a very adept video cameraman and editor and so forth. And so uh, basically he and I and some, some of our assistants, uh, that is, you know, A2A assistants or volunteers also helped. Uh, Betty Sword was one of those. And we, um, we actually built a huge double door cabinet. We took one of these double door equipment storage cabinets, put it on wheels and put, you know, reinforced it with bars so that it could be secured and left, left in the gallery. And inside it was pre-wired. So we just would take everything out in the evening, 
you know, unlock it, take everything out, set it up. Um, and that was how we transitioned. The main reason that we that we avoided going from audio to video, though, was practicality. It was very easy to set up audio, really, and and very cheap to do audio. And in order for us to switch to video, we needed a whole bunch of equipment, albeit it was it was almost entirely used, um, and you know held together with bailing wire and, and gaffing tape or whatever, but. Uh, it, it was quite a, it, it became quite a challenge to make the transition initially. Once we got there, then uh, we wouldn't have ever thought of going back. You know? hmm. at, at what point, and may have been right from the beginning, were you planning to archive this material? Birth. No, seriously. Uh, you know, keeping in mind that each of us was in the audio video area, you know, we were techie people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we knew how to do it. And, uh, you know, I, we would be dishonest if we didn't say that we were shocked after it survived the first year, you know, that we thought, how can this possibly, you know, how can it possibly go forward because it's so ad hoc? But after, you know, after we got to three or four or five years, then we got to 10 years, it started to dawn on us that we better take care of the materials because at some point, somebody's going to be interested in this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're actually capturing art history. Uh, and uh, as, you know, as it later turned out to be when, when Liza Kerwin, who is our, uh, still our contact at archives, <clears throat> When she and her colleagues were first looking over the materials based on the flyers in, initially, she was one of the first people to say, the range of what you would do is so amazing. It's a good thing that you recorded them because you know, one week it would be graffiti art, the next week it would be four professors from NYU, art, hist art historians. A week after that, it would be earthworks. A week after that, body art, it, it was so covering the waterfront aesthetically that we were, yeah, we it, were determined to make sure that we documented it from day one. We were right. absolutely clear about that. Right. And we were absolutely clear that we wanted to make sure that the rights were okay because of the release forms. We mm -hmm. didn't do any formal archival looking around for quite a while because we were concentrated and we were all volunteers, you know, taking care of artists talk on art. And then we said, well, there has to be a place that will actually preserve this. And then we started uh, years long, <laughs> several years long, uh, you know, escapade at finally getting an actual archive. Right. I, but, I was what we also had the archival of the club, Sorry. yeah, sort of freshly, freshly in mind as, what happens when you don't archive something that is crucial to history? Well, well and we, I know I certainly didn't know whether the club had been archived or not, yeah. or whether there were recordings or not. I'm not sure any of us knew at the time. We just came out of the, the, the mindset that we were going to definitely preserve and document. Right. We didn't know, you know. Uh, and uh, but I, I just had a sense that I needed to be the mother hen of, of preservation. So. I would make sure that things were stored in a, a warm, dry setting. And, and for many years, I actually kept these things in my own home, uh, but never in a garage or never in a, in a setting like that, always in indoors in a, and always boxed. And, uh, and if possible, the, the actual materials in plastic cases you know, or, or cardboard cases uh, to keep dust away and so forth. Mm -hmm. How how big is the archive? Uh, uh, what are we talking about in terms of running feet, numbers of tapes, etc.? Uh, <laughs> numbers of tapes. Well, uh, the number of recordings uh, is a little inexact. That is, there there's some there are a few gaps here and there, but I would say it's on the order of there's two different answers. One for the number of tapes and the other for the number of, of events recorded. 
the number of events held is over a thousand at this point, the vast majority of which were recorded, uh, and most of those are accounted for. But the number of actual pieces of media is more because in many cases, there would be, uh, if it was cassettes, for example, there would be two or even three cassettes and sometimes even four uh, for one night. And so part of the archival process was uh, putting that all together, segregating by media, segregating by year, identifying the date, identifying the uh, who was on the panel and so forth. Um, and uh, I was gonna say, I have here, if I can get this slid out here, This, this says ATOA, oh, ATOA photo scans is also an ATOA scan disk. And of course that's all on USB these days that has on it all the flyers. So uh, the issue all the way along was uh, keeping it organized, getting it organized. And even in the last few years of, of where I had it up in Woodstock, all over the place, stacks, uh, mountains of stuff, um, that even at that stage, I was contacted by a former assistant to Vernita Nemec, who said, I've got this zipper bag in my closet. I don't know what this is, but there's a bunch of little tapes in it. And I said, tapes? A, a bunch of little oh, tapes. tapes. Yeah. Um, and he had about 50 audio recordings, some of which were copies of things we already had, but there were a number of things in there we never had. I met him, I met him in Chelsea. I should have had a, you know, a, a slouch hat and a trench coat because these were extremely important as mm -hmm. it turned out. So uh, it was a little bit of detective work along the way. So then the archive also includes, I'm, I'm assuming, photo documentation. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. And I'm a lot of informal, informal snapshots, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the papers of the organization. Right, right. Uh, so, and first of all, the, in the scope, it's about 8,500 artists and curators and other people in the art world uh, that right. were recorded. Uh, there are thousands of still photographs, thousands. There are... Uh, I don't know exactly how many, but many, many hundreds, probably several thousand uh, emails, you know, uh, and then there are documents, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets. Uh, there are um, press clipping books that were kept over periods of time. The vast majority of this material that I'm describing is in Washington at Archives of American Art. Um, uh, and some of that work traveled. So we, we gave specific permission to allow the traveling of physical materials. Some people don't do that, but our whole, our whole intent was not only to make it close to uh, public domain, but also to allow for sharing uh, to museums and other institutions. Right. Yeah, so you, you, you wanted maximum public access to the materials. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Yeah. Right. Uh, are the photographs uh, um, in black, I guess they're all in all in black and white. Uh, uh, I mean, they're not digitized yet, right? They're physical uh, photographs. The, I know that, that uh, archives, uh, Smithsonian, is in the process of scanning uh, many of the photographs and many documents, key documents. Uh, but they're, they are color, they're not, uh, of course, the earliest ones tend to be all black and white. Uh, but over the years, there were many color images taken. We also, I left out, we also have a slide bank uh, from when artists would appear during the slide era before JPEGs. We asked them, would they please give us a small handful of slides that we could retain? So we, we amassed quite a collection, uh, many thousands of slides. Mm. But do we get to keep the photo? I mean, if we wanted to have access to the photographs, would, would ATOA be able to do that? Well, anybody can have access to the still photographs, to the recordings, et cetera, you know, to papers. That's it, so, thank you, Mark. Yeah. Oh, but it's through, it's, it's through yeah. the Smithsonian. Yeah, 
Right. But, but they can be borrowed, let's say, for a, sh uh, a show or? Yes, that's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, or maybe maybe a, a copy made available. I doubt that they would lend out the original, but I'm sure it they depends. would make copies I mean, available. If you're, for, if you're the Museum of Modern friends. Art or, you know, or the Getty or whatever, uh, you probably could get your hands on originals. How did you, you mentioned an auction, but were there, were there other ways that you paid for the digitization of the materials that you digitized? Meaning that, that, that ATOA itself digitized before it went there to were, archive? There were grants for that purpose. Uh, and, you know, people have asked me, what do you think the cost of the digitization was? And I'm saying, we don't know to the penny, but I'm gonna say north of 200,000 and possibly as high as 250,000. The for, vast for, majority. For what, you, for what you digitized before right. you turned it over. Right. So, okay. and, and part of the commitment of the Archives of American Art, as I understand it, is that they're gonna to continue to digitize things. Uh, yes, yes, they will, but as far as audio and video, you know, recordings, uh, everything that they have now, all, all of the materials up to May of 2016 were given to them digitized to oh, their, okay. to okay. their standards, which are quite high. And we are now about to top that off with another five years of material, which contains about I'm going to say something like 120, maybe 130 new recordings. But those uh, are all digital recordings to start with, I assume. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. One of the things we discovered when we were trying to place the archive is that every single organization we talked to required us to digitize. You know, so yeah, it was up to us to, to arrange all of that before we handed it over. That's true. But you know, it, it should be noted though, even before we were heavily searching, even before the the archive, you know, the, the marriage brokering or whatever you want to call it, that phase, that's where I had to put a flower behind my ear and a little cologne under, you know, and whatever. Uh, that before we long before we got to that phase, we had already digitized all of the audio and had raised a substantial amount of money just to get the audio digitized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah. What, what, would, what would you say is the most important legacy of Artists Talk on Art? Historic preservation, I would say, you know, you'd have to say. Um, I like to say also that, um, you know, our legacy is built on the contributions of artists, but it's also a, you know, it's also um, a peace offering to their families. I mean, it's, it's people that appeared with Artists Talk and Art, whether they were big names, you know, famous artists, and there were many of them, uh, or complete unknowns, uh, it, it's also a place where their families can go and find materials about them. And, uh, and that happens all the time. So uh, it's very gratifying to me that in addition to, uh, you know, the, the action that we took in creating and sustaining a forum, that we also preserve so much of it. Yeah, I and think the legacy is, is the content. It is the programs, which are the context for what was happening in the art community right. and in the, in the art movements. Right. I mean, you have something more than just, you know, the art show. And it's interesting. I don't know about all the museums, but one of the museums, which almost took, <laughs> said yeah. they had nothing like this. We're talking right. about 2016, 2015, 2016 now. They'd had all these great shows, but no conversations, panels, mm -hmm. programs with the artists that they had presented. Right. No real so, documentation of those. Right. Of those yeah. So it, the legacy is the content, which mm -hmm. includes the artists, the conversations, and the fact that they're available. Mm -hmm. that, that was what, one of the reasons why it was so important that mm -hmm. whoever took them made them available. You know, the, the uh, Steven Spielberg effort to, uh, to memorialize and, and uh, record 
Holocaust survivors. And I'm not equating what we did to that. I'm just saying, though, that uh, is a kind of witnessing of the Holocaust. It's a, it, it's a witnessing of the personal experiences, the opinions, uh, the, you know, and the history. And so I think that, that a big legacy of Artists Talk on Art is its role as a witness to the art movements and the artists and the, you know, the street protests and the graffiti and just all the, all the sweat and toil and, and uh, uh, you know, thoughts and, and hopes of, of so many artists were, were and are in, encapsulated in what we uh, held and recorded and preserved. Yeah, it's like the same reason why Walter Gropius had, you know, students make two. He was smart enough to know that if we didn't keep an archive together, we would hardly know anything about yeah. what he did there. You know, it's it's really it's really really important. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How did how did the uh, how did the pandemic how did COVID change the organization? It, it clearly it, it kind of drove you online, right? Well, we were we were already, and I, I credit Flash Flashlight. I credit him with with working with me toward the end of uh, establishing a virtual way, a virtual presence, and uh, we were already beginning to experiment before the pandemic came along. Uh, but one of the joys of the of the pandemic, if you can put it that way, was that it it forced us to jump into the deep end of the pool, uh, you know, to, to embrace Zoom that we knew nothing about initially and to um, start doing weekly. It also propelled us into doing weekly events where we were doing more like once a month or once, or once every two weeks. Uh, so we, we started not only to, and, and another result of doing Zoom was that it, it blew open our, uh, our audience. We started having people from Europe, from you know, from the Middle East, yeah. from, from Asia, from all parts of the United States, tuning in as as participant viewers. And also we had people from many of those same locations on panels and doing dialogues and open studios and that sort of thing. So I, I don't think uh, now that the genie is out of that bottle, I don't think there's any going back. And if anything, what we're looking to do now is build on that and go to an even more globalized uh, reach. Well, that that uh, that goes maybe to my to my last question, which is what what does the future hold for the organization? And building on what you just said, would you would you want to create? Um, would you want to franchise ATOA? Would you want to create ATOA France, ATOA Germany, or or? Uh, no. I mean, I think, I think that, uh, I mean, there are people that come along and start talk series that last for a year and, or a couple of years. Uh, and we certainly find it interesting to see, we've had people approach us and say, tell us how you do it, you know? And what we say is, uh, first you agree to a life of poverty. Uh, and then um, you also agree not to go to the bar until, until uh, everybody's already left and gone home. But uh, being facetious, but you know, uh, you know, I don't think the rewards are are enough for an independent series, uh, even in virtual space, as they are for, let's say, an institution. So, mm -hmm. for a German museum, for a Japanese museum, for a, you know, a cultural organization in LA or whatever, you know, it's possible to do a talk series and support it through that institutional budget. But for an independent series, it, which is always what we've been, um, it's, not, it's not so easy. However, I would say going forward, we would certainly be amenable to some sort of marriages with uh, different platforms, uh, with uh, a museum, with an educational institution. It's something we've thought about in the past. And maybe that's, you know, that may be part of where we're going. But it, but as far as, you know, a franchise in Berlin, no, it should just be, uh, 
German speakers uh, who, it, it, it's just, as you well know, in almost every country, English is the lingua franca. Uh, a lot of communication is done in English. So uh, from what we're seeing, we're just trying to target more and more international audiences in English. Uh, and if it inspires a few knockoffs, all the better. We were approached, I think after the first five years or so, we've been approached off and on by organizations. Um, I think the new museum was one of the first yeah. saying, bring it over here. We'll run it for you. Right. And the reason we never did that over the years was to keep it open to not have just one institution deciding what the programming would be. And there's nothing wrong with that. And mm -hmm. that organization went and did their own series. They may still be doing something. And all of that's great. But one of the things that we've always said about Artists Talk on Art is it was open again to any artist who could get artists together to discuss something about art, the art community, the issues that were happening at the time. And we've let it be very eclectic, very open, uh, even when it's boring or chaotic. Uh, and that's been one of the things that stayed true to it throughout the years. That's, that's true. So, you know, um, soon to be a major motion picture. I don't know, I don't know what to say, except that- uh, uh, We'll see. Yeah. 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 I, I'm reminded of, 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 a, of a skit that, uh, uh, Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner did the 2000 year old man uh -huh. and there's a passage in there where, where he's he's manufacturing the 2000 year old man is manufacturing Jewish stars uh -huh. and someone comes to him and he and they offer him a cross and uh -huh. he looks at it and he says it's simple it's too simple I didn't know then it was eloquent <laughs> yeah and I think I think in uh -huh. a certain way that's 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 part of the artist talk on art magic is that it's a very simple idea as Lori just expounded, you know, Keep get a up. bunch of artists together who have a, have an interest in something and have them talk about it. Right. And in, in as cheap and, and, and non-remunerative a situation as possible. <laughs> That's true. Um, and honest, very honest. You know, yeah. and uh, and it's it's worked for going on fifty years now. So that that in itself is amazing. I, I think that's that's the last question I have. So maybe now, if people want to put some questions into the chat box, uh, I'll I'll pull from there, or uh, and we can continue talking. Or people who are already uh, visible here can ask questions. I don't see anything new in the chat. I have one question about the uh, film footage that was taken um, a long time ago. What format is that in? Film footage or you mean video? Um, well, when you first started this, were, were things recorded? Not just audio, but you well, know. Here's the, here's the answer. Uh, there were uh, on a couple of rare occasions, a video shot. Mm -hmm. uh, who has that? I don't really know. We don't that I'm aware of. Okay. The video been... started in 1991 in three, in three quarter inch originally. Um, and no, all no, of that's been digitized. But uh, there were early, very early on, Bob Wiegand had his own porta pack and he did do a little bit of shooting with that, but I've never seen it. So yeah. it'd be interesting to see those. Though. It may be that that may actually reside at archives because his archive is at Archives of American Art also. We do have a question from earlier in the chat from Patricia Lees. Uh, Patricia asked, would you say that your talks were mainly attended by and marketed to artists? I think we, I think we answered yeah, I actually, that. Yeah, I actually answered that. And yes, yeah. that was obviously yeah. part of the whole formatting. That's one of the reasons the name is what it is. Right. When we debated names for days, yeah. Yeah, and then it was like, we're going to name it, and I think it was Bob Wiegand said, it's like a German tradition. You name it exactly, literally what it is, uh -huh. and the logo was run together. It was all one word, artists talk on art, because right. that's what it was, artists talking about art. And it was aimed at an artist audience, but anyone could sign up 
and receive the flyers or the invites mm -hmm. and anyone could attend. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that the vast majority of the audience has been artists, but people were interested, people were in town that day, et cetera. Yeah, but Patricia Lee's just added a, added a comment, but it's also a kind of a question. It sounds like your program was artist-centric. Galleries and art museums in the 50s, 60s, and 70s kept artists away from the public. Huh. Uh, hmm. about that? No. Again, anyone could attend, only artists. For the most part, only artists were the people who were going to do the, the program, and yeah. it was an artist programming committee uh, that reviewed. And as I said, about eighty percent or more were accepted, uh, mm -hmm. as long as you got three or more artists who wanted to talk yeah. about something. I, I don't really, I don't really agree with. Is it Patricia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the the art world of the fifties was basically Tenth Street, so it was tiny. Um, the, by the 60s, there were already many people going to galleries, and by the 70s, the scene was pretty big. Of course, today it's massive, but, um, uh, you know, uh, the idea, though, that the galleries were trying to keep people away, I don't think is correct. I think that uh, even if you look at the early days of Soho, 420 West Broadway with Castelli and the other galleries, uh, it was very much uh, you know, promoted to try to get people to attend openings uh, to, uh, there were a lot of parties that were being thrown in lofts and the whole idea was exposure, you know, getting people to see the art. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if anything, now we have the art fairs. So uh, art has become much more public between art fairs and social media mm -hmm. uh, and the whole experience of Learning about art, meeting artists, building relationships is what it's all about at this point. But it, it was very much like that in those days, just on a much smaller scale. Now I feel like it's entering the entertainment industry. <laughs> yeah, well, from my perspective, we entered the entertainment industry in art when the big museums, starting with the Metropolitan Museum, started doing in the 1960s these blockbuster shows where you had to get a ticket in advance and so forth. Yeah. That was Hollywood coming to the art museum. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's- One of the yeah. things that was happening in the seventies and into the eighties, which may not be happening as much now, I'm not as familiar, is a lot of artist run galleries. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, there was like a proliferation of those for quite some time. Right. Uh, and it was in response to the fact that it would have been very hard to get into regular dealer run galleries. Mm -hmm. um, you still have artist run galleries. I'm not sure it's, it, you have as many now. It, it's, it was a different era, but that's when that pro proliferated. Not just a, a show that artists got together and put together, but a gallery that they ran and owned and right. It, it's still, you know, uh, artist run galleries, you know, co-ops are still definitely a sliver of, of, the, of the art world. Uh, but uh, I think the big transition is to much more social media related, you know, Instagram, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, it's, yeah, a very, yeah. it's just a very diverse and, and the scale is unlike anything we would have dreamt of 50 years ago. I mean, it's just un, unreal. Yeah. It's like the, the Van Gogh uh, extravaganza. I don't really have a desire to see it, but you know, because to me it's like, I don't know, it's it, it's kind of taken, you know, it, that becomes real entertainment, I think. Yeah. But people people have gone and said it's beautiful. So you, you mean know. the immersive, the immersive experience? Yeah. 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 Right. Ellen Ellen Coleman says, uh, although I grew up in New York City for years, I would go back and always knew where to go Friday night. It's nice to be able to see this from afar. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, 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 hey, Ellen, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to, because I was at some of those early uh, ATOA events and, and uh, participated in some and was some just as a listener. And um, yeah, to, to, to look back at how, how, again, how elementary it was, the basic idea. Um, and yet, 
no one else was doing that. And they're still doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think this is in your hands, Kristen. Well, if it's not too late, I kind of wanted to add another question. Okay. okay. Um, well, in addition to the historical narrative that our record, I should say that A two A is making with these talks, I'm curious to hear about you know what you guys find personally important about putting artists in dialogue with each other to speak about their work and ideas in a colloquial sense, as opposed to the institutional narratives created by directors and curators and academics. Right. Institutional well, narratives. You know, the, the most obvious one is we never had an ax to grind. The artists might have, their gallery might have, you know, their publicists might have in, in, in more recent years, but ATUA didn't have an ax to grind. That is to say, it was, it was an open forum uh, to allow, as I said earlier, the, you know, the Christos and Jean-Claude's who are world famous and people that you never heard of, but to give them a, as equal as possible a footing and allow them to have, um, in our case, their, their 90 minutes of fame. Yeah, it, it's the fact that the artists got to speak about their own art and issues without any curation right. 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 or promotion from outside. Right. It was what they wanted to say, how they wanted to say it, whether it was boring or interesting or chaotic or calm, it was the artists speaking for themselves. And speaking, as you keep saying, primarily to other artists. Yeah. So this, this was artist to artist communication, yeah. large, largely. Mm -hmm. And primarily. Right. So I, I see Babs Ringgold and she's saying, I guess what she's inferring is now that we're virtual, she's able to attend our events more easily because she's not in New York. So uh, mm -hmm. um, we're happy about that. It's a nice, it's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. um, I like to be able to sit here with my books behind me and um, in my rocking, you know, appropriately rocking uh, chair and, um, and do these Zoom. So it, it's a very comfortable way to do it. Uh, again, back to you, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to our moderator, Alan, to Lori and to Doug and for the members of our programming committee, our volunteers and interns and our board of directors. And of course, everyone for coming tonight. Thank you for being here and hopefully see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.